We're at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City. Um, we are interviewing Mr. Clifford Perry today. Mr. Perry served during World War II um, in the Army. Uh, Mr. Perry is here, and I am Janet Skank, the director of the library. Mr. Perry, did, did you enlist in the service? Or no. You, you did. You were drafted. No, I was drafted. Okay. I see where you said your service date was 1940. That was before... No, yeah, it was supposed to be 42. Oh, 42. I misread that then. I'm sorry. Okay. So you were drafted. Were you living here in this area in Columbia City? Yes, out here about five miles out on 205. Okay. Were you married at that time? No. Couldn't find it by the... Okay. Um, uh, did you have brothers and sisters? Yes. And did, were I they... had, I had uh, three brothers and three sisters. And did any of those serve? Any of them serve in the? Uh, yes, my oldest brother was a waste gunner on a B-17 bomber in England. Uh -huh. Was he already in the service when when you were drafted? Yes. Okay. Um. You were your parents living at that time also? Yes, they were. They? What did they think about you all being drafted? Mm -hmm. What did they think about all of you being drafted? Well, I can imagine that they hated to give up their kids, uh -huh. but uh, there wasn't much they could do about it. Did your sisters uh, stay at home then? Were they involved in the war effort? Well, yeah, they were here at home in the factories. In the factories. Well, do you know what a life was like for them here? What life was like? For them here during the war. Well, no, I can't tell you what life was like for them during the war, other than what uh, what they related to me with letters and, and telephone calls. What, what kind of thing did and they... And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't, I guess, a bed of roses. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the times they talked to me, I kind of thought maybe I was better off than they were. So, but it worked out. Once, once you were drafted, where did you go? I mean, you received your draft letter. And you were told to report somewhere? Yes, uh, up at the local draft headquarters, which was up above in what's now McGregor Furniture Store. Uh, and that was just a quick over examination to make sure you were still warm. And uh, I'll never forget that. There was a, an old doctor from Old Arlo up there. Well, there were several doctors up there, but this one old boy over there. I don't know whether they had uh, tremors or shaking palsy or what, but I got my arm laid out on that board, and he got down underneath it, and I might not get this the first time. And I said, you better, because I ain't going to be here for the second time. Was he giving you a shot? Or? He was taking blood. He was taking blood. So then he left the doctor from over saw Willie take that. So you passed that preliminary test, and then where did you go? Well, then <clears throat> uh, I turned 21 in June, and it was called up in July, and I went to Toledo, Ohio, in a big armory building up there that was, to me, it looked like a gymnasium with just a, just a floor. It was on the street level, and there was windows, biggest here the way around it. And those window sills were only about two foot off the floor. It was hot, the windows were open. And if you can picture this, there was probably two to four hundred men in that building, all of them stripped down stark naked, going from one station to another to another to another. One guy would probably take your eyesight, another take your hearing, and this, that, and the other. And there was people walking by on the sidewalk right outside those open windows, and there's this whole room full of naked men in there. And <laughs> it, it happened every day, I suppose, up there. And I put those people up here, the civilians got used to it. <laughs> so I figured if it didn't bother them, it wouldn't bother me too much either. And. Uh, they give you a pretty decent physical. I mean, if you were warm, you're gone. Uh -huh. 
And I had sustained, sustained an eye injury when I was probably 12 years old. And uh, mm -hmm. I didn't pass that physical. So they sent me back home. And then they got down to where they was, I always said, scraping the bottom of the barrel. I got called up again in November. Same year? I think part, Same year? Yes, in 42. Uh -huh. And uh, we went up to camp, and we went up to Toledo High again, the same building, same, only they didn't have the windows open this time, it was cold. And uh, there was several, several of us in this area went at that time, and most of us had some kind of a disability. Uh, had a boy from over here south with me. I went to school with, had the first two fingers off on his right hand, and got him over here to our little hand, a glass eye. And we were told that we would probably never leave Indiana, Kentucky, Illinois area. And uh, so then, they swore us in and sent us home on a 13-day furlough to uh, finish things up, get our papers in order and everything. And on the 17th day of November, that was the day they swore us in, and then on the 30th day of November, we got on a bus up there in front of the draft headquarters and went someplace over the high and got on a train and that train was delayed for about three hours someplace over there. It was another train going, we were going east and this train was going south and we had to sit there and wait until that train got out in front of us. We got up to Camp Perry, Ohio on Lake Erie and it was cold and uh, we got there just about supper time. Now, if it bores you, I No, it's fascinating. And no. uh, so they took us over to a mess hall and feed us. Down the middle of that mess hall was a row of posts to support the roof. And on those posts was... Now, I'll never forget this. And on those posts was a bunch of posters to preserve food and don't waste food and this, that, and the other. And this old boy from over here saw what they had the two fingers off. Leaned up against that post on one of them posters, and about 47 cockroaches took off off one of that poster and went up that post. And we got a good, and we started going around just tapping those posters, and every one of them was full of cockroaches. This is where you were eating? <laughs> just before we started eating. Just before you started eating? Uh, it was just. That's the way things were. And there was one guy in that outfit that had been there for quite some time. And he had, he would get a pass every night and go downtown someplace. I don't know where he went. And uh, he'd get drunk and come back. And one of the kids had brought some English walnuts with him. And they of course sat there and ate those English walnuts. And they put them walnut shell down in this guy's bed, just about where his feet was. <laughs> he come back, loaded, got in there, and when his feet hit them walnut shells, he took bed, mattress, and everything else, went right straight up, just screaming bloody murder, because he knew the cockroaches were in his bed. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was quite an experience. They took us over then the next morning. Issues is our clothes, and that was the one time in my life that long john underwear was really welcome. It was down to eight below zero up there, and I caught KP the next day over the officer's mess. <coughs> and then we got fitted up for the rest of the clothes. I wore a size 10 shoe and they throwed a pair of 11s at me, or two pair of 11s at me. And when I got out, those 11s fit pretty good. <laughs> then on Monday morning, we loaded up on a train and went west. We stopped in St. Louis, Missouri and stayed in the train station all night on these 
cars on the train. And uh, they took us in Fred Harvey restaurant, fed us. It was quite a thing marching in our 97 men, marching in this restaurant with the civilian people in there. And they all got up and started applauding their meals and that and So then we went on down and we got down as far as, I think Albuquerque, New Mexico. We got off for supper again. Now it took every, every train to come along, we got on the siding and left them go through. We went down to Albuquerque, we got off, and when we got back on, some jerk from New York had, <laughs> out there on the train platform, had stepped in some either dog feces or human feces, I don't know which. He got on the wrong car, he got in our car, tracked that all the way through the car, and this boy from over here at South Willie had the bunk above me, and he had a kid curled up in old Max's bunk with that manure on his feet. <laughs> old Max jerked him out and let him drop on the floor and drug him back to the door of the car and kicked him out on the platform. And then they had to come in and they kept the bunk, get that smell out of there. And then the next stop we made was Hawthorne, California. It was 78 degrees. Sun was shining. Uh, nice, beautiful day. There we were in our winter underwear, our wool coat and pants, carrying our overcoat. And everybody kept going, where have you guys been to Alaska? It started quite a few arguments. And uh, we were there about a month. And then we saddled up and went to Seattle, Washington. Or not Seattle, up to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington, and took basic training. And it was eight weeks. It was raining. I'd been raining for two weeks. And then it got cold. Froze ice and then snowed about a foot got down below zero. <laughs> the tents, the, where we slept was a, there was five men to a tent. It was, had a board floor, it was boarded up about shoulder high. And then from there on up, it was like a pyramid thing with a tent cover over the top of it. In the middle of the floor was a box about, a wooden box about four and a half feet foot square, full of sand. In the middle of that box of sand was a stove that was just like a funnel turned upside down, set in that sand. Had a little door, about that big square on the front of it. And if you burn wood, you had to have a spark catcher on top. The four inch pipe went up and out through the top of that tent. And uh, if you if you put the spark catcher on, then the chimney plugged up and smoked you out. If you took the spark catcher off, you could lay there at night and look up and pretty you could see a star. Then pretty you see a couple stars, you jump up, get your shoe, and go around that hole, putting the fire out. <laughs> Is that what they gave you to burn? Wood? They gave you to burn wood in it? We had slab wood <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> and coal. The coal made a lot hotter fire, but I went up to breakfast one Sunday morning. I, one of the tents up there, the door was open, the old black smoke just pouring out. I walked over and looked in and got down and looked in. There was five guys laying in there in bed with their gas mask on, asleep. Their chimney was plugged up. In order to get the dumb thing unplugged, you had to shinny up the ridge pole and drop a piece of coal or a stone down that pipe, clean that soot out. Now we lost, the rumor was we lost 15 men up there that winter to pneumonia. In fact, matter is we go to town and we come back 
on the bus and got off the bus driver got up to our corner. He'd holler, all you guys want to get off here at Pneumonia Valley. And that was the kind of weather when we did our training on. What kind of things did they train you? How did they train you? Well, we had close order drill, what they call close order, where everybody was going in and turn on the we, we did uh, judo training, and uh, then we had classes on military courtesy and this, that, and the other. But uh, it seemed to me like we had a little Indian give us our judo training. He was about five, six, weighed around 140 pounds. Why he he took a liking to me for some reason or other, and when he gave a demonstration on uh, judo, he picked me. And I was never so sore and stiff in my life as I was up there, but he had flopped me around like a no wet dish rag. His name was Wahweeton, they called him Corporal Wahoo. And he was part, he was, he was in the Army? Yeah, he was, he was in the Army, he was Corporal. But he liked to go downtown and booze it up at night, and then when he'd come back, he'd come in before Revely, wake me up, sit on the side of my bunk, tell me all about where he'd been and what he'd done, and which I could care less what he did. But it was interesting, you know. So then, Later on, it got nice spring. I think it was in sometime in black part of March. Oh, the sun come out. It was warm. We were right in the middle of a bunch of pine trees. It smelled nice. They shipped us back to California. On the way back, some kid in our car broke out with the measles. So we got quarantined down there in Long Beach. Two weeks. Couldn't associate with any other men, couldn't go to the show, couldn't go child, we had to go we had to eat by ourselves. And how many men are we talking about that we quarantine? It was like a Italian or how many people are we talking about? Well it was just it was about twenty, I about guess. 20? It's, it's the one one train car. Oh, on from the train. The, okay, on the train. And uh, then we get up morning go we're, we're down at the mess hall and eat breakfast after everybody else had gone. And then we'd hike down to the beach, it was only down there about six blocks. Take our shoes and socks go off and their tops of our clothes and we'd swim down there and lay on the beach all day long and hoping and praying that somebody else caught the measles. They didn't. So we did some training there uh, this March and and one day they come along and we saddled up, we got on a convoy, took off for San Diego. Now, the road between Los Angeles and San Diego at that time was about like driving old 30 from Columbia City to Larwell. And uh, when we had, when it come time for chow, they stopped right out along the road and got up burners out and cooked their dinner right out there along the road. We got down in in San Diego and there was a big aircraft plant down there, consolidated aircraft made those B-24 bombers. We guarded that plant for nine months. It was right with a fence, and we were on one side of the fence, and that big, big marine boot camp was on the other side. And they had these airplanes they built, the B-24s, they built them there, and then they'd take them up and fly them around. The one came in here one day and landed down there, and his brakes went out. He got up the end of the runway. He went through the fence. They went right out through that boot camp, just, just demolishing those old tar paper shacks. And the boys that was over there said there was, the paper said there was two killed and I don't know how many hurt. The boys were over there, near the other way around, there was probably two hurt and 30 killed. And uh, 
it went along about, uh, oh, I suppose three weeks, and they built another bomber, a new one, an experimental job, and they took it up one Saturday morning. We, we stood out there in the yard and watched them go. It was, at that time, a, a huge aircraft. And they flew that thing for about three or four hours, and they came back and set her down. Took it back down to hangar. Two weeks later, they got it out again, and they loaded it with sand. And uh, was going to take off loaded. And they got up to the end of the runway, and they, he got the front end up, his tail was dragging. And he left it down when he went across the road. He gunned the two left motors and got the thing turned down the road. He got down there a couple blocks and he gunned it again and got it turned back over on the field. But one wheel run over an anti-aircraft gun pit and it swung it around. He went back through the fence hit the administration shack over there at the Marine boot camp, tore the wing off right outside the outside motor. And when he got stopped, that stub wing on that thing was sticking in the window of the Commandant's office. <laughs> the other boys over there, no green boots of camp fellas over there was really, they had hard to keep those airplanes over there. This happened within just a few weeks of each other? Right? Huh? It happened within just a few weeks of the first time we were yeah. to the shacks? Yeah. And uh, so then <clears throat> I was out on guard one night behind the plant. Well, I'll go back a little further than that. Some funny things happened down there. We had a kid by the name of Smollett. He was out of Cleveland. And he was back there one afternoon. We had that thing. The line of us was clear around that thing. And uh, is there a time limit on this? One hour. About an hour. And. Uh, Train come down from Los Angeles. Every day there's train come down. Miss Smollett was on the, between the tracks and the fence. Dog was under there. Train come down. He got down and looked under there to see where that dog went. And somebody flushed the toilet on the train as it went past him. <laughs> but anyway, I was back here one night about two o'clock in the morning, and they came up with a jeep and said, "You gotta go in." And I just knew something was wrong, and uh, I went in, and my father had uh, been killed over here on Lion Street, and uh, so I took off for home. That was Tuesday night. I took off at home on Wednesday night, and got into Chicago Sunday morning. Hitchhiked over, over to South Bend and no, I rode a train over to South Bend and I hitchhiked home from there. And got home. And that was in December. And in the meantime, my older brother was in service and went, got shot down over the English Channel in July. And then my father was gone. I came home and while I was home I was transferred to Seattle, Washington. Was to report to 1805 Fifth Avenue in Seattle, Washington. And we took over town to Trouble in Seattle, Washington. In other words, we did the same thing with the servicemen as the city police do here. I mean, we did a lot more of it. And uh, it was a good deal as far as that goes. We had Class A passes, and the only time we had to be there was just for inspection at 6 o'clock. What, what is a Class A pass? I'm sorry. I that allowed pass. me to go any place that I wanted to go within a 300-mile area, and all I had to do was sign the book at the door when I went out and when I come back in. And... Uh, <clears throat> It was it was a good deal. We, we we didn't have to do any drilling or nothing. 
so then... You were an MP at this time? Yes. So, like the picture that you showed yes. us? Yes. That was taken right outside okay. there in the, the, the old army building we stayed in. Now, I was there 13 months, and in uh, the latter part of November, I went out to hospital with rheumatic fever. And I was out there through December, and the last part of January, they come out and told me that I could come home as soon as I got out of the hospital. So one day they come out and picked me up, went back and shoved me right downtown working that night. I worked 15 nights straight. And then they cut my orders and uh, got me ready to come home. But were you coming home on leave or being discharged? Discharged. Discharged. And uh, <coughs> we caught a train. Now I'm winding this down. Okay. We caught a train out of Seattle into Chicago. And uh, from there we, I caught a train, went to Indianapolis and caught a bus out to Camp Atterbury. And they put us in a building over there. Was, the bunk I had was right on just like on this side of the wall, and on the other side of the wall was a furnace. And they had a bunch of Italian prisoners down there. Uh, one of them fired that furnace over there. 3 30 in the morning, he came in and just shake that tar out of that old furnace. Everybody get away, and then he go in and leave. We actually draw straws to see who shot him. <laughs> and uh, then there were several colored fellows getting discharged at the same time. They took us all over in the building and gave us a big spiel about uh, thanking us for being in service. And, and, yeah, one know if any of us would be interested in re-enlisting. He don't know how close he come to getting shot too. But uh, then the day come that we got out of there, they put us on a bus and we went to Indianapolis. We caught a bus from Indianapolis to Fort Wayne. And I get into Fort Wayne about uh, 6.30. 6, 6, 39. Now this was on February the 9th in 1945. And I started walking from the bus station. I got over on Sherman Street about where the old Norwalk truck line used to be. Truck driver picked me up. Offered me a cigarette. Of a, I, I, to me it looked like it might have been corn shucks. And, uh, so I had a pack of Lucky Strikes in my pocket. I offered him one of them, and I thought he was going to ball. Then we talked, coming back into Columbia City. When I got into Columbia City, he left me out, and I had seven cartons of Lucky Strike cigarettes in my duffel bag, and I gave him one of the, a carton of those cigarettes. He wanted to give me $50. And I said, no, I'll just give you that for the whole way over to Columbia City. I said, it's the last ride I'm going to make this way. So I got in here and I went down to the police station and called no buddy of mine. He come and got me in. And uh, I was home. After I was home a while, I contacted this rheumatic fever rundown. I mean, uh, and uh, since then I wound up with two open heart surgeries having two valves replaced. And I've, that picture is what I got to show for it. The whole time I was gone. You, you were an MP? Mm-hmm. Well, can you tell us the kind of things an MP had to do? What, was your, what were your duties? <laughs> well, 
if fight started, we had to step in and break it up. And I got scars to prove it. Uh, we kind of took care of the boys. And see, Seattle was a big port of embarkation where the boys were going either up to the Aleutians or out into the Pacific and either going or coming. The ones who were going out knew they were going into combat, so they kind of <laughs> wanted to enjoy themselves, which I don't blame them a bit. The ones that were coming back had been through the combat, and they cut loose, and it was our job to kind of keep them straightened up and keep them killing each other here in the States. Uh, one night, one week, there was a uh, battleship come in up there, and every night they rented a nightclub, a different deck on that ship throw the party up there, and they were supposed to have their own shore patrol, but they didn't. At about 11 o'clock, the manager come running out, and, ah, tear the place up, tear the place up. At that time, I was walking one MP and two shore patrol together. And due to the fact that I carried a pistol, and they didn't, and two of them got cut up one night, so they figured they'd better put a gun in the crowd. And so we went in to this nightclub, 300 sailors in there fighting. I'm the only soldier, and I got back over the corner and left and go to it. But uh, it was just, just stuff like that. And, uh, one night up there, the, See, Seattle was built on a hill. And you get up on 10th Avenue and look down the waterfront, cars look about that long down there. And uh, I was down there on 1st Avenue one night, and the guy come running up out of the alley and said, there's a naked woman down here in the, in the doorway. And I went down, and this woman was drunk. She was naked, and she had a black pocketbook, and she was trying to hide behind it pocketbook. If it hadn't been so pitiful, I believe I could have laughed real good over that. I went up and called the civilian police and they come and got her, took her up and threw her in jail. She had came down the back stairs of that hotel, walked out after the paper. Why she went out naked, I don't know. But, and the door blew shut behind her and it was locked. She couldn't get back in. So I figured I did my good deed there, but... Um, what, what kind of relationship did you have with the civil authorities, the civil police? We had, we had good, uh, we had good uh, relations with them. Uh, our jail, we had a section of their jail for a while that we used as a service jail, but uh, we got along pretty good with them guys. Of course, there was several that Shore Patrol up there were ex uh, civilian police. And uh, they had, they had a, a uh, well, I don't know just what you'd call it, but the one Shore Patrol walked with me one night, uh, some big wig, I suppose, in the city government threatened him while well, we was. He said, you know what you're going to do after the war, you're going to be back riding a motorcycle. Huh. And uh, the kid was with me, didn't seem to like that very well. I had another short throw with him, it was a professional boxer from over here in Iowa. He stopped, he stopped the little sailor one night and was checking his ID card. And I don't know what made that kid do it, but he grabbed that card. He said, what would that happen if I just grabbed that and run? No green, the boxer hit him. Just that quick, knocked that kid flat. Huh. He said, now that's what happens if you don't want to get smart again, I'll give you another one. But it, it was an experience that I'll never forget. And I enjoyed it most of the time. We, we lived pretty decent. Good food? Well, most of the time, yes. Now, we were not overly fed, 
uh, when you go in for breakfast, you have 12 men at a table, six on each side, and they set a half a gallon of milk down for six, for 12 men. Along towards the last, the last two guys down the other end of the table didn't get much milk. Eggs, <laughs> we ate fresh eggs that were packed. You know, you're not going to believe this. In 1949, I mean 39, 1939, they were packed in cold storage. And they, were, they had a big griddle on top of the stove that was probably that big square. He'd break a row of eggs down the row back. He was one of them to break eggs with both hands. Huh. He'd break one down here and he'd start running over the side and he'd just scrape it off the side and keep on going. Huh. It, it had its day. <laughs> he had to cook a lot of eggs, didn't he? He ate a lot of eggs, yes. Now, there was a place right down the street from where we were stationed that sold government inspected horse meat. I mean, it was some of the nicest looking red meat you ever saw. It was really horse meat? Oh, yeah. Huh. And the civilian population bought that like it was good beef. Was that rationed like beef? Mm -hmm. That was a rationed no. horse meat? Them old horses, they'd shoot them and skin them out and butcher them. And it, 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 it looked like good meat. Now, I've seen cuts of beef that didn't look near as good as that did. Some of the civilians that I talked to said it was good. Huh. It was better than nothing at all. And there was a place right next door then where you could buy you could buy a salmon. You know, a whole salmon. I went down there one day and bought one. It weighed 15 pounds after it was dressed. And the head was all. And they shipped it, they packed it in dry ice and shipped it back to my sister out here. It cost me $9.40 for that fish and to have it packed in dry ice and then shipping in the whole works. And we had fish every Friday. Uh, it wasn't too good. And kids here thought that that salmon I sent home was, oh, it was just great. They sliced it off like steaks and fried it. Uh, what, did, what did you do before you were drafted? Well, I worked on the railroad a while, okay. and uh, then I started, my cousin had a little truck line here in town, and I started working for him, and delivered dry freight, and right around town, you're just local. I tried farming, couldn't stand the smell of horse manure, so I got out of that. After I got out of service, I helped mother on the farm a little while. And then I started driving a truck. I hauled gasoline out of East Chicago for two years. And then I got over on a, a local truck line that delivered stuff bought like I'd been doing before service, only a, a lot more of it. And I worked there for 20, well, 34 years altogether and retired. And I haven't done a lot of work since. So what you did the service really did, you weren't trained for anything, the service, to help you after you got out of the service, no. you know, the training? <laughs> How many of the, the uh, organizations like the American Legion or BMW, did you ever participate in those? Oh yeah, I've been, I'm going, I'm been a legionnaire now for, oh, since 1946. What kind of things did you do as a member, what kind of things did you do? As a member of the American Legion, what kind of things do you do? Well, we just attended the meetings, and and then later on I got on the funeral detail, and uh, I run the firing squad for a while, participated in the firing squad at these military funerals, and uh, 
just kind of guzzle a beer once in a while. <laughs> Wait, we did, when did you get married? Were you out of service? Yes, I, oh yeah, I was, let's see, I got out of service when I was 25 and got married when I was 27. Uh, April, of, oh, my wife will kill me. April 23rd. 1949. Been married. Soon be 56 years. Did you know her during the war? Did you know her during the war? No, I knew. I knew of the family. Uh, but um, no, I really met her after. I've been out of the service for a while. In fact, my husband, her sister worked in the office of the truck line that I got onto. That's how I got into driving the truck. Huh. Well, after the between home gasoline and home the drive freight, and and, uh, and I got scared out hauling gasoline. You go out on some night when it was so slick you couldn't stand up on the road. And, Go along there and look around and see that big tank full of gas hanging back there in your hip pocket. Give you something to think about. Certainly Mr. Perry, I need to, before we end this, uh, i got to make sure I thank you for this because it has been very interesting. Is there anything you'd like to say we talk about that I haven't asked about or you haven't mentioned or any parting words? Well, uh, some funny things have happened. Sure. It happened. Uh, I was in Seattle working at the, what they call the Trianon Ballroom, big, big dance hall. And uh, Joe DiMaggio was there, and he was the staff sergeant. People got to mob him for an autograph, and we had to get around him and take him out because they wouldn't leave him alone. I was out at the ballpark one night, the Pacific Coast League ballpark in Rochester. Jack Benny in Rochester was uh, Eddie Anderson. He was out there, and the same thing happened to him, and we had to get around him. And I led him out, and three or four of the other guys got around behind him on the side of him, keep people from grabbing him, kept him out of there. It was, uh, it was interesting. We, down in California, I was at the Hollywood Canteen one night, and uh, Pat O'Brien was there. But he was sitting there at the table with three or four other guys. And uh, there was a little sailor and some girl with Jim about it. And I mean, they was really going to town. I thought that Pat O'Brien was going to fall off his chair laughing. He was, he was getting a big charge out of that sailor. And that kid was really dancing up storm. Did you go to many, were there many of the USO uh, shows where there were a lot of the stars there? Well, I never went to too many USO shows. Uh, you go to Hollywood Canteen. A lot of movie star stuff come in there and just... Did you just walk in? He wasn't in by invitation or anything? No, no, no. It was open to service men. Any, any service person? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you can walk right in. Now, the, the one thing that I'll never forget, I came home on the train one time, and I stopped and the train stopped over in Illinois someplace, Iowa or Illinois. And all we had to eat on that, it was a, it was not a troop train, it was a civilian train. The porter sold us peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. There was a dining car on that train, but you couldn't get close to it. And uh, so they stopped over and I asked the porter, I don't want to go be there. He said, be there about 45 minutes. And I thought, well, I got off that train, I ran upstairs to Fred Harvey restaurant, and I got a order of pancakes and sausage. 
I told him, I said, I don't have much time left, and I, I've got to get it. So they brought it right out, and I ate, got up to pay the bill, and there was a block of long traffic there of people that wanted to pay their bill. And I got that much time. So I went around the line, walked up there, and I think my bill was a dollar and twenty-seven cents, something like that. I threw down two dollars and run downstairs, and I run the length of that train and got on. The dumb thing is set there for another hour and a half. Ah. Uh, <laughs> didn't make any difference. I had a, I had some good pancakes, and I think it was in Streeter, Illinois. The women walked along the platform. The windows were open on the train, and they'd hand sandwiches and and hot coffee in through the windows to us. Just giving them to you. Yeah. There wasn't like, what, was it the American Red Cross did that with the donuts? Well, I don't know whether it, it, uh, the people took up donations to buy this stuff. Uh -huh. And I've often wondered where they got the meat. Yeah. Meat was rationed. Yeah. Well, coffee was too, as far as that goes, but <laughs> I don't know. You kind of look back now and wonder why what how a lot of things happened. Now I tried to go overseas in in 40, 43. They took a bunch of guys out of our company that was going to go over to Africa and bring back a load of German PWs. They were just going over to Fort Henry, Virginia and then on over to Africa and back. <coughs> Be going about six, eight weeks, and I thought, you know, I didn't like San Diego at all. So I went over to sign up, and they had the list was full. But if anybody got sick or got hurt or something, I was first up on the list, and they all took off. Six weeks later, they came back, all except the guys in, in my company. They stayed in Africa to guard that. PW camp, and I didn't know how long I'd have been over to Africa, probably yet. Huh. But that's as close as I came to going overseas. But, uh, like I say, it's an experience I, don't, I wouldn't take the world for, and I don't think I'd want to do it again. Have you done much traveling since, uh, since you came out of the service? I've done a little. But nothing, I had a brother-in-law living out in Powell, Wyoming, and we made several trips out there. We took several trips and went into Wisconsin fishing. But for me to get rid of it, I always thought maybe I'd like to go back to Seattle and we'll see how, how it was in, in peacetime. When we got up there, they paired me up with an old man by the name of Cornelius O'Sullivan. He was about six foot four and about that wide across the fanny and about that wide across the shoulders. And his arms hung down almost to his knees. And his face was all pockmarked. He was a beautiful man, inwardly. And they stuck. Sully and I down on Skid Row and said, clean, clean it up. We did. <laughs> I'm afraid we do have to end it now. Um, thank you very much. Fascinating story. Well, I'm awful glad I lived it. <laughs>